Praise the Lord. It's good to see everyone this morning. And I will keep it short. I really wanted to greet you, but most of all, just to tell you thank you. Uh, thank you especially for uh, mom's home going and praying for us and praying for the family and praying for her and all you guys have done for her all the years. Uh, thank you so much for that. But I wanted to specifically tell you thank you for praying for me. Most of you know I was, uh, I got back to Nairobi on about the 10th of March. I'd, we'd been here in the States for seven months and traveled all over the place. I had never had any pain, never had any problems. And the night I got home, I started running high fevers and was just... Uh, just got so sick in just a matter of hours, and uh, all of you heard all about that, and I won't go into all the details, but my blood was infected, my kidneys were infected, uh, and I was just in, had a, 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 an ulcer in my intestines, and honestly, I had not had any problems, had any issues, and I, even the doctor said, you've had this for a long time, have you not been sick? And I said, no, I've not even had a fever, not had pain, but uh, God was with us. Uh, we were in Europe for 10 days with Janine, uh, between leaving here and going to Kenya and the two countries we were in, there's very little English spoke. So I so once when I got sick, I was thankful to God and I said, God, thank you for not letting me get sick over there. Uh, that I was in Nairobi, I was at a place where I had some doctors that I could call on. But uh, we went through all of that and they checked me and I know it was prayers. One day I was, uh, they put me in a hospital a couple of nights, really not because I, I needed to go to the hospital, but the doctor said you can either come back and forth day after day and do tests or you can, we could put you in the hospital overnight and we can run most of these tests in one night. I said, I opt for that. Let's do that. Uh, so we did that and, and they did. They ran tests on everything and uh, never really found out what caused the infection, never really found out where it came from. But thank God I feel, I, well, I didn't feel bad before, but all that's gone and I know it's from your prayers. So thank you for your prayers for us and for me especially. I uh, feel great today. I'm doing great. I, I thank the Lord. I'm heading back tomorrow. Uh, and uh, Sharon's been holding down the fort for the last three and a half weeks since I've been gone. And just again, thank you so much for your support. You, you guys, are. I tell you every time I come, you are our number one supporting church that we have uh, in all the work that we do. And you have been for many, many, many years. And we thank God for that. Thank you for praying for us thank, uh, and supporting us. Thank you for supporting Janine. She's doing a great work. I just talked to her last night. She was almost uh, ran down by a car in the streets of Hungary yes, uh, two days ago. Uh, and she said, the guys, people that were behind her said, we don't know how that car missed you, Janine. It must have been an angel that pushed you back away because uh, they were rushing to get to a train that they had to get to, and she didn't see the car and just ran right out in front of it. Uh, but God spared her life. So thank you for praying. Those prayers you pray that you just sometimes wonder, well, I'm going to pray for them. I don't know why God's put them on my heart. There's a reason God's put you on our hearts. There's things that happen, but thank you for that. And if I can just leave you with one thing about the work, pray for the countries of Ethiopia and Uganda. Both of those countries are experiencing some internal strife. We have about 27 churches in Ethiopia that have been destroyed because of rioting uh, going on between two different tribes of people. So pray for our churches there. I probably have about, I think they told me about 10,000 people of ours that have been displaced. Several hundred thousand Ethiopians have been displaced. And also Uganda is going through some internal strife and distress. So pray for them. And we, we appreciate what you're doing for us. And God is making a difference in so many places around the world. And Taylor, you have a big part of that. So thank you so much. I'm heading back tomorrow. won't be back for a while. But thank you for your prayers for us. And God be with you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor, for just letting me greet everyone. Thank you, sir. Amen. 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 Well, let's see, I, I had it on to start with, and I got it, turned it the other way. I'm going to ask you, if you would, please, to turn with me in your Bibles uh, very quickly to the Gospel of John. And uh, this will be, uh, for at least for now, uh, until the Lord says, go back to the Gospel of John. Uh, this is going to be our, our last sermon uh, from John's Gospel for a while. And uh, I'm going to bring this series of sermons uh, to a close. Uh, but I want to say again, thank you, thank you uh, for your faithfulness. I realize there's a lot of, uh, still a lot of people vacationing and doing a lot of different things, but you're here, and, and uh, that's, that's wonderful. And um, uh, we're going to, this week, uh, we'll finish this, and then, God willing, uh, as we go down the road, we'll be looking to where the Lord leads, and 
I have some idea as to what I think the Lord is uh, saying as far as the direction, um, but um, I'm going to hold that close just now until I know for certain in my heart that that's what uh, I believe the Lord wants us to do. Um, in verse 18 of John 21, the Bible says this. The Bible says, Jesus said to Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that when you were young, uh, you gird, girded yourself, and you walked whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. And then Peter turning about seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Now that was John. Which also leaned on his breast at supper. And he said, Lord, which is he, said, Lord, which is he that uh, betrayeth thee? And Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, that is, uh, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. And then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that the disciples should not die, yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come. What is it that, or what is that to thee? And this is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other uh, things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So John is giving us again this this peek into this situation that was going on with Peter and, uh, and the restoration that Peter had, uh, had been going through. I'm glad the Lord Jesus is in the restoration business, aren't you? And without a doubt, uh, I believe that is uh, what is taking place in this chapter. And it's predominantly about the restoration. This chapter is the restoration of Peter. And you and I, we've been, uh, we've been studying about him since we've been in this chapter. And as a matter of fact, I had a little assignment uh, this past Tuesday. I was at Beach Springs and spoke at our conference chapel uh, for the month of July. And I just could not shake uh, the subject of Peter. And I spoke from Luke chapter 22 where Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I, Satan desires to have you. And he desires to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. And I prayed that your faith would not fail. In other words, that when this takes place in your life, when this happens, when he said, I pray that your faith would not fail, he wasn't saying that Peter wasn't going to have this mess up, but that it wasn't going to be a permanent knockout for him. He might get, it might get him down, but it wasn't going to knock him out. And, uh, and how we react and how we respond and the comeback is so important in life. And he said, but I, I'm praying that when you have fallen or when you fail or that your faith will not fail, but that when you've been converted, when you've been restored, when, uh, when you uh, have a back on track and you've got your head on right again, I want you to strengthen others or strengthen your brethren. I want you to strengthen others. And, uh, and I think this is a very defining chapter in the life of Peter. I realize that it won't be very long until Peter will be uh, with the other 120 disciples and he will, uh, or followers of Christ, and uh, he will be waiting on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And just like the Word declares in Acts 1 and 8, he will be empowered to be a witness for Jesus. I realize that and I understand that. But I also understand that 
Peter had to deal with these things before he could ever get there. He had to go back and deal with some things about the past before he could go forward. And he did that and we see the results of all of that right here in this very chapter. Jesus has already asked him about his love and he's encouraged him to return to the ministry. He said, Peter, if you love me, feed my lambs. Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. And we went through that, that part of this text on last Sunday morning and we made the necessary applications then concerning that. But now Jesus says something very interesting to Peter. And the reason I say it's very interesting because it's part of our service to the Lord and part of our service to the Lord includes this idea of following Jesus. That we have to follow Him. And, uh, and following the Lord is about commitment. And this morning, that's the title of our message, Following Jesus. And, and it's something I believe that is desperately needed in the world of Christendom today. We need people that have real commitment. We need people that are totally committed to the Lord. We need people uh, that are truly sold out for Jesus and for His cause and His purpose. I mentioned this book to you, and it's, it's a few years old now. It's nothing right off the press, although I think it's been updated and maybe modified some. The last time I was in the Christian bookstore locally here, at least it was, and I mentioned to you this fellow by the name of Kyle Eidemann. And Kyle has written a book some years back called It Has to Do With Not Just Being Fans, But Being Followers of Christ. And we need to be more than part of Jesus' fan club. We have an awful lot of people that like to be part of the club. They like to be a fan in the stands and they like to watch everything that's going on. And, and you know, they like to shout and have a good time when things are the way they ought to be and everything's going the way our team, the team we pull for the most, uh, is, is going in the direction it needs to go. But there's not a whole lot of involvement with those kind of people. As a matter of fact, it's probably crude for me to say, and I don't mean to be, ha be harsh, and I don't want it to sound like I'm, I'm being too hard, but there are some people, and, and again, they're just so disconnected and on the fringes that if I depended on them for us to keep this place running, we'd be in trouble. And, uh, and you, don't have to, you don't have to look very far, probably, you might even have one or two of those in mind uh, this morning. And, but the point is, is that I believe the Lord is looking for true commitment. I believe He's wanting us to truly be committed to Him. And so I want us to look at some of this for just a moment. And let's just see what Jesus has to say with regard to following Him. I think, and this is probably the, 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 the simplest thing about this entire message, this first point at least, all of this message is simple but yet it's profound, it's, and not because it's a message I'm preaching, but it, because it's, it's, it's God's Word, and, uh, and it drives home some real serious po uh, points for us this morning. And if you look at those verses again, in particular there, it really, pour, it really brings out and shows us the fact that following Jesus is a personal decision. That it's a personal decision. As a matter of fact, when you look at those verses again, eight, verse 18 and 19, and, uh, and look down through those, at least through verse 22, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, when, you're, when you were young, uh, you, you gird yourself, and you walked whether you wanted to go, wherever you wanted to go. And, and, uh, but he said, When you get older, things are going to be different. As a matter of fact, you're going to stretch your hands, and, and, uh, and you're going to... Uh, another's going to gird you and another's going to carry you where, where you would not go. When, uh, when you were younger, you certainly wouldn't have went. And it's going to be a place even when you get older, you may not want to go. But Peter, you're going to be willing to do that. And of course, the Bible says in the next verse, verse 19, that he spoke that concerning the death by which he would glorify God. And then he looked at Peter when he had spoken those things and he said, Peter, I, 
I want you to follow me. Can you imagine a man's just told you you're going to die and this is the way you're going to die. You're going to spread your arms and you're going to die on a cross just like I'm about to die. I have just gotten, uh, you know, he, Jesus had already died on the cross and at just a few days beyond that, you're going to die just like I died. You're going to die the death of a martyr and he still looks at him and says, Peter, I want you to follow me. Notice that he said, follow me. And then Peter turned around and there's still enough of the old Simon in him. There's still enough of that old man in him that he's looking around and he says, well, what about him? What about John? And Jesus said, well, if I let him live till I come again, what does that matter to you? I'm telling you, you follow me. You follow me. Don't look at everybody else. Don't worry about John. Don't worry about what someone sitting on the pew beside you. Listen, when it comes the end of the day and we stand before God and we give an account, we're not going to give an account on somebody else's basis. We're not going to give an account because grandma prayed for us all these years. We're not going to give an account because we came in the door on her coattail or anybody, mom's coattail or anybody else's coattail. At the end of the day, we're going to give an account for where we are with Jesus Christ and what we've done with our relationship with him following him following him and so when Jesus says to Peter follow me and he's saying that to us follow me he's calling us to connect with him he's calling us into a relationship with him he's calling us to a person he said follow me you're not following a program this morning we're not following a denomination we're not necessarily following a, do, a doctrine. We're not following a routine. We're not following something that we do just every Sunday and we put on our, our Sunday face and our Sunday clothes. No, no, no. This is about an everyday, up-to-the-minute relationship with Jesus Christ. Peter, I need you to follow me. It's, it's like being married. You have to keep that fellowship alive. You have to keep that alive in your life and you want to communicate and you want to be with the person that you love and you want to be near them and that's what I'm talking about. This decision has nothing to do with anyone else. It has to do with you. It has to do with the Lord Jesus. It has to do with me. It has to do with Jesus and what we do with Him and our relationship with Him and staying close to Him and staying in communion with Him and staying in relationship with Him like he would want us to. So Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I want you to follow me. It's a personal thing. I want you to follow me. I want you to be in relationship with me. Quit worrying about everybody else. By the way, everybody else will sink your ship. Don't you worry about them. All you've got to give an account for is you. At the end of the day, when time ends and we're done, we're going to give an account for who we, what we've done with Jesus Christ. Follow thou me, Peter. He said it to him on more than one occasion. He said it twice, as a matter of fact, in these few verses. He says, follow thou me. Peter, I want you to follow me. Don't worry about everybody else. Don't worry, don't worry about them. Oh, I'm not, when I say don't worry about them, that doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for them. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't encourage them. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to, you know, for other people to, uh, to, to come into the fold and, and uh, by all means, that's the Great Commission. That, that's what it's all about. But I, what I'm saying is sometimes we look around and we see other people and we think, well, God sure has blessed them and look at my life or God this, has done this for them and look at me and don't look at other people. Concentrate on your relationship with Jesus Christ and concentrate on knowing Him better and concentrate on what you do with Christ not everybody else. And so he said, follow me. It's a personal thing. This is a personal decision. Following Jesus is... But the second thing I would say to you is following Jesus is a progressive decision. It isn't something that you just say, well, I'm going to do this, and that's the end of it. As a matter of fact, look at the text again. What did he say? He told Peter in verse 18, he said, Peter, when you were young now, and I've done shared this, I'm not being redundant, I just want you to see it again. He said... Peter, when you were young, you did what you wanted to. You walked where you wanted to. And, uh, and you did everything, and you lived your life the way you wanted to live it. 
He said, but when you get older, you're going to do things differently. And there's going to be someone else that's going to gird you and carry you whether thou wouldest not. In other words, what you say right now, you would never do. Places you say right now, oh, I, you know, I, I want to live my life for me. I want to do what I want to do. I want to live the way I want to live, Peter. When, you're, when you were a young man and you did what you wanted and you spoke what you wanted and you said whatever you wanted and you went wherever you wanted and Jesus said, but as you progress, things are going to change. And they're going to change even to a point that you're going to be willing to give your life for my sake. It's going to get that intense that you'll be willing to give yourself for me. Now, how does that happen in a man's life? How does that happen in a woman's life? Well, I think we have to think for just a moment what it really means when we talk about this idea of following the Lord. Let me just give you a few things. Following the Lord implies being submissive to Him. That we submit to, we submit to Him. Remember, to follow means to go the way that another is leading. Following is not leading. Some people have the idea that they're supposed to do the leading and God's supposed to do the following. It's just the opposite. God leads and you and I, we're to follow. And so we have to submit to his lordship and we submit. And by the way, you'll never serve well if you've not learned to be submissive to the Savior. Because service involves, service involves submission or it's not service. It's not service. And you have to submit to what Christ tells you to do. Otherwise, you're not following Him in service. And so, we talk about this idea of serving the Lord. Well, we have, in our service for the Lord and the things we do for the Lord, we, have to, we can't forget to follow Him. And we can't forget to submit to Him. And not only does it imply submissiveness, but it also talks to us, and I think it implies a steadfastness that we continually follow the Lord. We don't just wake up one day and say, well, I'm going to follow Jesus today and somewhere we fall off the tracks uh, along the way, but rather it's not a decision that we just made years ago and it's something done in the presence. It's a, it's a daily walk. I was walking with him right this very second. The Apostle Paul, he gave us some glimpse of what it means to follow the Lord in the book of Philippians. He said it like this in chapter 3 and verse 7. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. The next verse he said, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. In other words, these are waste that I may win Christ. And he goes on and he says this in verse number nine. He says, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that, that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And notice this verse, verse 10, that I may know him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be, being made conformable unto his death. He says, I want to know the Lord. I want to know Him so well. I want to know what it's like. And I want to know Him so well that, that I, I want my life to be conformed into the image of Him. Just like, just like when He died and, and, and it was a selfless thing. I want to become that way. I want to submit to the Lord and I want to be steadfast in knowing Him and becoming like Him. That's what I want. That's what we talk about when we talk about following the Lord. We say following the Lord is a progressive decision. Another way we could say it, when we start talking about following the Lord, we're talking about sanctified living. We're talking about separating ourselves to the Lord. Some people have the idea that, yes, sanctification is separation but it's not separation from things. It's separating yourself to the Lord. And when you separate yourself to the Lord, those other things have a way of just dropping off somewhere. Because the closer you get to Him, and the more like Him you become, the less like them you become. You see? And so it's a progressive thing. It's a progressive decision 
that we make. And it requires being submissive and it requires being steadfast. And by the way, it requires sacrifice. You won't follow the Lord without some sacrifice. I remember we said last week that the Christian life is, is supposed to be a selfless life. And some people haven't quite, and even in my own life, some, I, I, I guess at times my greatest enemy is me. And we run around and give the devil a lot of, we give him a lot of heartache. And, and yes, he is our worst enemy. I, and he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. I, I agree with that 100%. But I want to tell you, sometimes the devil doesn't have to do a whole lot because we done done it for him. Pardon my grammar. I don't know if you can say we done done it for him or not, but I just did. It requires sacrifice. You remember one time in Matthew, the 19th chapter, remember one time a rich young ruler came to Jesus and, and said to him, said, Lord, what must I do? Or good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why did you call me good? Only God's good. The Father's good. So I said, why did Jesus say that? Because Jesus wanted to see if this man recognized him as God or not. If he, if he, if, if he really recognized the fact, if, if Jesus was good, then what he was saying is, you're God. And so Jesus gave that interesting exchange with him. And Jesus went down the list and he talked about keeping the commandments and all these things. And the man, every one of them, when they went off the checklist, the man said, oh, I've done those since I was a kid. I've done those since I was a kid. I, and then Jesus got down to the heart of the matter and he says, well, now I need you to take everything you've got and I want you to go sell it and give to the poor and the needy and come back and follow me. And the Bible says he walked away heartbroken. Now the disciples were watching that scene you read it. Go home and read it in Matthew chapter 19. The disciples were watching that scene. I don't know if they were privy to all the conversation that was going on. I don't know that they heard everything that was going on. But what they saw was, they saw this man come to Jesus and they saw him walk away without having to give up anything. And undoubtedly they must have heard some of the conversation. And, uh, and Peter was the one to speak up because he was often the mouthpiece for the group, you know. And he said this in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27. And this is one of my, my favorite little verses for some reason or other. Peter said, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. What's in this for us? What are we going to get out of this deal? This man just walked away with everything. He doesn't have to give up anything. What Peter was missing is that because that man wasn't willing to give up anything, it hindered him from following the Lord. And Jesus went on and Jesus replied something like this. In the last verses, two verses of that chapter, he said something like this. He said, Peter, everybody that's given up houses and they've given up their brothers and their sisters and their father and their mother and their children and their property for my sake, they're going to receive a hundred times as much in return. And they're going to inherit eternal life. But as many who are the greatest, he said, will be now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now are going to be greatest then. Peter, you just follow me and trust me on this thing the rewards are going to be out of this world. You may think you're, you're having to give up everything now. You may think you have nothing now. But Peter, just take me at my word. This is not all there is. It looks like he may have something and it looks like he may be important. But I'm here to tell you, he's, one day he's taking a back seat to you. And you're going to have all the reward. Just trust me. It requires sacrifice. It's, it, it requires dying to self and selfish ambitions and goals and desires. And sometimes it re, it's required, you know, we, maybe we have to give up some things. I, I don't know. 
Only you and the Lord can work those details out. But just remember that it does require some sacrifice. I want to give you the last thing very quickly though. Not only is following Jesus a, a progressive decision, but it has to be what I call a priority decision. It has to be something that you purpose in your heart and mind, I'm going to do this and it's going to be top for me. It's going to be above and the others, the other decisions in my life. It, it's going to be something I'm going to take very serious in my life. I think a lot of times, and it's so easy for all of us. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not speaking down at anybody this morning. I'm just here to remind you, it's so easy for us. To, we get so caught up in living life here. And we get so caught up in the everyday and just living in the cares of life and, and, and our jobs and our, the cares and the hobbies and, and all these things that we love. And, 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 and those things take priority many times in our lives. And, and our decision for Christ and, and our priority for following Christ seems to take a back seat oftentimes. We have to be careful about that. All of us do. We have to stay in check concerning those kind of things in our life. In verse 22, again, remember, I told you what Peter asked. Peter asked the question and said, Lord, what about this man? And you know what Jesus responded when he said there in verse 22? Jesus said, Look, if, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And I think as I read that, reread that verse and I, I read it again, you know what I come to? This is the conclusion that I just seen. I felt like the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart and dropped in my spirit concerning that. Peter, I don't want you to be distracted. I want this to be a priority decision for you. And don't let anything or anyone distract you. Don't, you don't, don't put your eyes on anybody else. Don't, don't let anything distract you. Let this be a priority for you. In other words, my decision and your decision to follow Christ, let's let it be a priority decision this morning. That, In other words, we want it to supersede everything else. Jesus has an encounter with three different people. And if you allow me, I'll illustrate it and I'll close in Luke's gospel, the ninth chapter, three different people come to Jesus. And they come to him with the intention of following him. Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 57. The Bible says something like this. The Bible says, It came to pass as they went that a certain man said unto them, Lord, I will follow thee wheresoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said unto another, Follow me. This is the second one. He said, Lord, suffer me first to go and, and to bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, let me just help us with it for just a moment and we'll wrap this up. This first one came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, well, if you want to follow me, let me remind you of some things. And the things that he reminded him of was he started talking about the things he might have to let go of. As a matter of fact, Jesus brings it down like this. And, 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 and believe you me, I, I, I believe God blesses. I believe he blesses us. And if you don't believe we're blessed, just look at us. Look at, look at our, our homes and look at, look at the blessings that we have. I know God's blessed Alice and I. I know we've been blessed. We've, 
we've done our best, uh, and I don't mean I'm not mean this bragging. But we've done our best to be faithful to God with our money and giving to Him and supporting the work of the Lord and the ministry. And God has blessed us beyond measure. But it's not a it's not a matter of of, of but God doesn't want you to have anything. I'm not trying to, I don't even, that's not the principle that's being, being conveyed there. What Jesus is saying is, would you be willing to give it up if I ask you to? It isn't that God doesn't want you to have a nice car and he doesn't want you to have a nice house and he doesn't want you to have a bigger camper, Bruce. It isn't that. But it is, what, what would you be willing to sacrifice if he were to ask you to? And, and Jesus laid it out and said, I want to tell you, sometimes God's little animals have a better place to live than I do. They sleep better than I do. They have nests and the fox have dens. And I don't even have anywhere to lay my head at night. If conditions got like that, would you still serve me? That's what Jesus is saying. If it got that bad, would you still serve me? Would you still love me? Would you still follow me? And so that's, that's, that's the text. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what he's telling this man. And, uh, and obviously, obviously it was a hard pill for him to swallow. As a matter of fact, he, he didn't swallow it. And, uh, and, and, and he turns away and, and we hear nothing else out of the story. We hear nothing else. He didn't follow the Lord. And then a second man comes to him and, uh, our, our, as Jesus is passing by and Jesus looks at him and he says, well, follow me. And he said to him, he said, well, I, I've got to first go and, and bury my father. Now, I call that guy the procrastinator. Because he, he, like, he was procrastinating on the thing. He's, I, I, well, Lord, I, I, would, I would like to follow you. I would, I would like to commit to you. I, I, I would like to, but, but I, I've got some things I've got to take care of, right? Just, if, you just if, if, if certain things can line up like they're supposed to, and let me just take care of these things, then I'll give you all that I have, and I, I'll commit to you all the way. Now this guy, he said, I got to go back and bury my daddy. And Jesus looked at him and said something pretty strange. He said, well, why don't just let the dead bury the dead? Well, I, I think what Jesus was talking about, Jesus was talking about the spiritually dead burying the dead. But when Jesus said that, it seems to be harsh and crude. But it isn't harsh and crude because if you know anything about that culture and you know anything about, about how they would do things, a man would be buried in less than 24 hours. They, they didn't embalm like we embalm. Their embalmment was spices. They'd spice a body. They didn't drain the blood out and put some, something else in. I don't have Jack Bargo here this morning to tell me how they do that. But, but, but they didn't put something else on the inside to preserve the tissue and preserve the body like we do. They just spiced it up to, Make the smell okay for a little while, but he would have been buried before sundown. So this idea that, and Jesus re realized that, and he recognized this man was bogus. It was a bogus claim. Well, I got to go. My daddy's dead, and I got to go back and bury him. But and when I get him buried, then I'll come back. Not we'll talk about me following you like you want me to. Those kind of people are procrastinators. Well, Lord, let me just get this done. Well, Lord, let me get this handled in my life, Lord. Lord, let, let, if, if you'll just let me get a better job than, and, and with better hours, then I can commit more to you. Lord, if you'll let me make more, you know, give, give me a better job and I'll make more money, then I can commit more to you. And it's just putting it off. And the problem with putting off obedience to Jesus is that there will always be one more thing you want to care for before you start taking him seriously. And I want to tell you, the devil will make sure of that. There will always be something else. There will always be something else. Let me give you the last thing. This third man 
He came to Jesus. And uh, he couldn't make up his mind. As a matter of fact, he came to him and said, Lord, I'll follow you. But the first thing I need to do is I need to go back home. And when I go home, Miss Evelyn, you play for me. I need to go back home and let me just, let me go in and tell mama and tell daddy and let me tell everybody at home that I'm going to strike out and I'm going to follow you. And Jesus knew what that meant. What that meant was this. It meant that he was going to go home and when he went in the door and he started to disclose and tell his family what he was going to do. He was going to be become vulnerable to their pleas. There would be a crying mama with tears down her eyes saying, saying, son, please don't leave us. Please don't go. There would be a daddy standing there like Warren Cleaver and saying, son, are you sure? Are you sure this is what you want to do with your life? Don't you want to give this a second thought? Don't you want to just consider it a little more? And Jesus says, follow me. Don't look back. That's what the implication of that last verse in this illustration is. When he says a man having put his hand to the plow, looking back is, is, is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. The implication there is is that if you look back, you'll change your mind. You don't have a made up mind. And if somehow you look back and you go back, you'll change your mind on what Jesus is asking you to do. I want to tell you, I know, and I can only answer for Red Lawless. And you have to answer it for you. I know what the Lord is asking for us. He's asking for complete commitment. He's asking total commitment. He's asking us to follow Him. Follow Him when it's good. Follow Him when it's bad. Follow Him when you have a lot. and Follow Him when you have a little follow him understand that following Jesus is it's not about you it's about him and it's about letting him lead it's about letting God get over Jesus get over in the driver's seat you take the passenger seat say now Lord let's go I trust you I'm going to follow you it's about being committed to him It's about total surrender to Him. Jesus said, Peter, follow me. Because if you learn to follow Him, then you'll be the servant you need to be for Him. But the first priority you and I have is to follow Him. Follow Him. Would you stand with me, please? Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, so many times in our lives we take for granted the wonderful privilege we have to follow you, live for you, and serve you. I pray this morning that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, any decision that needs to be made today you remind us and help us to remember this is personal it's a progressive it's progressive but for every one of us it has to be a priority Lord Jesus if there's one here who's not yet given heart and life to the Lord I pray this would be their hour of decision Lord there may be those of us who serve you Lord we we're Christians we could use some help in this area in our lives of following you. Lord, they need to respond today and come find a place to pray. 
if the Holy Spirit spoken to them, you direct us now, we ask. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to open the altar and whichever, however you may need to respond if you're here this morning, I'm going to give you an invitation to come. If you would like to come and pray, find a place to pray, you come. If you need prayer, you come. We'll pray with you. If you haven't yet given your heart and life to the Lord and you want to surrender today, say, Lord, I want to start my journey following you. I want to do it now. Why don't you come? Will you do it? Would, can we sing it together? I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. Would you sing it with me? All to Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender. How about it? All to him I freely give. I will ever, I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. about it. you just sing that chorus one more time as a prayer to him I surrender all I surrender all I surrender all all to thee blessed Savior I surrender Mike Hart, would you close us, please?